As the Second World War came to an end, the prisoners of the Germans were the first to be freed, but not before they experienced a terrible ordeal. German command ordered 280,000 prisoners and their guards onto the roads. Alexander Kerr had survived four years of imprisonment when he was marched out of his camp gates with whatever he could carry. The long march was a very brutal thing because uh, prisoners were being marched on an empty stomach, many of them sick, being marched in cold temperatures, freezing temperatures, uh, doing 16, 20 miles a day, dropping by the roadside. There is ample evidence to indicate that many Germans just shot uh, prisoners who fell by the roadside. Uh, they didn't give them much of a chance, they'd just shoot them outright. There were many instances on that long march of kindnesses by Germans to prisoners who were being marched, Germans who realised how, you know, stupid and ridiculous and inhuman the whole situation was. But then there were also many, many instances of absolute cruelty and, uh, and uh, murderous intent. Ray Corbett was marched from a camp in Poland. The worst winter in Germany's history and it was cold, it was really cold. Couldn't take your boots off, they were just freeze stiff and you couldn't get them on again. But then next morning you'd be out and pray, all right, fall in, move on, then you start pounding along, pounding along. And then a tank, big tank came up the gate, pushed the wire down, and out pops the Yanks. We said, are you Yanks? They said, well, you sure are, buddy. We knew it was all over. And then suddenly, it's like taking a wet swimming, swimming suit off, you know. Everything just goes. The Germans surrendered on May the 8th, 1945, and the Japanese three months later on August the 15th. But no one was certain of the location of all the Japanese camps, and no news had been heard of some Australian prisoners for years. There had been rumours about the existence of Australian nurses in a prison camp somewhere, but they were denied by the Japanese. An Australian war correspondent, Hayden Leonard, began searching for them, and his persistence was rewarded and the camp was found. Pat Darling and the other nurses were going home. Eventually, we saw a plane arriving and it landed and the first person off was Dr. Harry Windsor. And he looked at us, we were, we were the only standing people. He said, where are the Australian nurses? And we laughed and said, we're here, because we were dressed as best as we could be. <laughs> On that plane was also the principal matron of Australia, matron Annie Sage, who had been desperate to find her nurses. Matron looked at us. Somebody said, but who are you? And she said, oh, I'm the mother of all of you. And ever since I've had this position, I've wanted to find out where I was determined to find you. And she said, she said, where are the rest of you? And of course, there was silence for a moment. Then a voice, I don't know whose it was, just said, they're all dead. Marek Gilbert was found on the island of Ambon. This wonderful sight came down and Bombay. Four corvettes of the Royal Australian Navy, and I'll tell you their names. The Juni, the Kutamandra, the Glenelg, and the La Trobe. I will never forget those names. <laughs> I was on the Juni. Our own officers here had us lined up and we were assembled and uh, greeted by these fellas on the corvettes. And, uh, well, it's very, very hard to, to really to put into words our emotions at, at that happening. It was just so wonderful. The POWs were, of course, delighted at the rapid change in their fortunes. But many were also stunned at the changes that had occurred in the world while they were in prison. Ray Parkin was released from a camp in Japan. We didn't know just what had happened, but there were three major things that happened. The atomic bomb, jet propulsion. We did see a couple of jets come over. A and the third one was the biro pen. Oh, it was a, a pen you could 
Oh, they said at the time, you know, you don't have to refill it, it'll ride for two years. Bullshit. <laughs> that was the one thing we wouldn't believe, <laughs> was the bar of pen. <laughs> that was impossible. <laughs> On the Korean front, all is quiet as the truce continues. When the Korean War ended, there was no surrender, but a truce instead that is still in operation today. Both sides agreed to exchange prisoners, and Robert Parker remembers what happened next. So they had this bridge across that went across to from North Korea to South Korea, and they called it the Freedom Bridge. And they took us from the schoolhouse that they put us in and gave us cigarettes, and uh, on the, still on the north side they gave us cigarettes, and I didn't. I had a couple, and I started to go dizzy. And uh, they gave us things to eat and razors and all sorts of that. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. They exchanged us there and we spent a couple of nights there. We got uh, sprayed and disinfected it and, and everything. And we spent the night with a mob of Kiwis in there uh, at this place there. And they all got drunk and we didn't. We hadn't drunk for a couple of half years, two and a half years or something. Uh, it didn't affect us. but. It, they were all flaked out when we left. <laughs> when a war ends, many people's emotions can be dramatic, exploding with happiness. But servicemen and women who have been completely absorbed with fighting the war can often wonder what use there might be for them now. What will their futures be like? Perhaps the one shared feeling everyone has is an overwhelming sense of relief. For prisoners of war, though, these emotions can take weeks to show, and their new freedom can be as confusing to them as their original capture was, and just as confronting. Tom Pledger, a prisoner in Hainan in China, was taken aboard a hospital ship. And so they loaded us all on all the sick ones. We went on to the stretcher cases, and that. It's the first time I've seen any nursing sisters cry when they took us up that gangplank, tears are running down. Have you ever tried to talk to a woman if you haven't seen one or spoken to one for nearly four years? It's hellish and hard to find, I mean, hello, <laughs> yeah, to, to find something to talk about. There's them that talk to us more than we talk to them, I think. And of course, we didn't know anything about the atomic bomb. We didn't know anything about what had happened from the day we were taken prisoner, hardly. And uh, so anything they could tell us, even when she took your, your pulse, was marvellous to have a little woman touch you, no? But Bill Young, who had been kept by the Japanese in the infamous Outram Road Jail in Singapore for trying to escape, remembered only absolute happiness at the end of the war. And we hadn't seen the sky or the stars for two years. And we went down to the beach, there's a little beach at Changi, at the jail. And we went down and we sat there all night. We didn't, just sat there, the group of us. We just yarned occasionally and just looked and there was the stars and this huge moon came up. And the ocean was at peace as well, you know, it was just lapping into the shore on the sand. And we just sat there all night. And that was the most perfect night. It lasted so long, all through the night. It wasn't just a moment, you know, it was a whole night and it was beautiful. That perfect night was Bill Young's birthday. He turned 19 after being in captivity for three and a half years. Australia. Already 800 of their covers are in Darwin Harbour, arriving on the Dutch hospital ship Orania, to be greeted by thousands of service personnel who line the wharf in a real Australian welcome. When Australian prisoners returned home, the country gathered them to its heart in relief and triumph. Yet, as James Ling remembers, many prisoners were unsure of their welcome. We were naturally wildly excited, uh, but a little apprehensive. 
and that was very definite because we don't, didn't know how we were going to be greeted. Our first thoughts were we surrendered and nobody will want to talk to us. These other people have been in a war for three and a half years, all the people that we knew, and we really were apprehensive. It wasn't talked about publicly, but we, amongst ourselves, and we all knew, we were all feeling much the same way. And uh, we just wondered whether we would be welcomed back to the country that was our home. It only took uh, us to get down through Martin Place and the double-decker buses to begin to think, well, perhaps people do want to see us. Uh, the place was packed. Uh, it was ticker tape, which we'd never seen before, everywhere. People were racing out trying to hand bottles of beer through the doors and the welcome was absolutely overwhelming. At the end of the Second World War, Australia, like other countries, was not medically equipped to treat the mental state of the POWs. The families of prisoners were advised by the authorities to avoid mentioning the war if possible or to change the subject. When we came out of the prison camp into England, we were mental. But no way in the world could sit down and talk to a civilian. They start talking about what they went through. We just got bored. And we turn around and walk away. Terrible nightmares where I was back in the camp again and experienced all sorts of things. And I'd, you know, I'd wake up screaming or you know, muck sweat or something. That they were very, very difficult. But I was strongly resolved to get back into civilian life, to find a wife and to start a family. Counselling. All these chaps slather back from a war now, they only go be there one day and they're out for counselling. We never had a counsel in the world. We got straight off the boat and discharged and that was it. Nobody worried about it. Go to a doctor. They wouldn't know what was wrong. They got no idea what was wrong, what we'd been through. At the end of their interviews with the Australians at War Film Archive, each former POW was asked to reflect on what stayed with them still about their imprisonment, their war behind the wire. Here is a little of what they said. If I'd known what I was going into, I wouldn't have had the guts to face up to it. But having done it, I wouldn't have missed a minute of it. What I learnt and, you know, the friendships and all those things, absolutely invaluable. Some fellas have got it, some fellas haven't. That's the only reason why I'm telling you stories today, because you were determined that they weren't going to beat you. And you've got some funny determination thing. Now that I'm an older man and I think back a little bit, I probably had that determination all the way through. But as long as you rule your determination with gentleness, you can fit in society. And that's what I've tried to do. I think it was a learning period of my life. You learned a lot about life. You learned about a lot about the human side of it. You learned a lot that people can put up with a hell of a lot and still stay alive. Uh, people can put up with a hell of a lot and still be human to one another. 